Good afternoon. Good afternoon and welcome to the National Press Club. My name is Monroe Carmen. I'm president of the Press Club and editor-at-large at Bloomberg Business News. I welcome all the club members and their guests in the audience, as well as, as, uh, as, well as those of you who are watching on C-SPAN or listening to this program on National Public Radio or the Global Internet Computer Network. Before introducing our head table, I would like to remind our members of upcoming speakers. On Thursday morning, February 2nd, that's in the morning, Lieutenant General Sir Michael Rose, former commander of UN forces in Bosnia, will give us a talk on his perspective on the Balkans. On Wednesday, February 8th, <coughs> excuse me, Governor Tommy Thompson, Republican of Wisconsin, will talk about welfare reform and the new partnership. And on Wednesday, February 9th, Senator Bill Bradley, Democrat from New Jersey, will address the press club on a topic yet to be chosen. Audio and videotapes of press club luncheons are available through the National Press Club Library or by calling 1-800-500-9911. If you have any questions for our speakers today, please write them on the cards provided at your table and pass them up to me. I will ask as many as time permits. I now would like to introduce our head table guests and ask them to stand briefly when their names are called. Uh, from your right, Michelle Buzgon, Assistant News Editor, Knight Ritter Tribune News Service. Maxine Mawini, Good Morning Television and Reuters International News Hour in the United Kingdom. Charles Thompson, Senior Producer, CBS News, 60 Minutes. Doug Turner, Washington Bureau Chief, Buffalo News. Sandra McElwain, Freelance Journalist. John Grant, Vice President, Public Broadcasting System. Skipping over our guest, Ken DeLecki, Kipling of Washington Editors. Sharon Rockefeller, President of WIDA TV, Washington, D.C. Rachel Bale, Voice of America and member of the National Press Club Speakers Committee who arranged today's luncheon. Hidetashi Fujisawa, Washington Bureau Chief, and NHK Japan Broadcasting, Andre Gascon, Deputy Director, Canadian Broadcasting Corporation, USA, and Peter Arnett of CNN. I'd like to thank our staff, Melissa, Pat, Melanie, Jeff, for organizing today's luncheon. And I will inform you that I was recently elected president of the National Press Club, which I regarded as pretty big stuff. <laughs> However, our guest speaker tops that. He was knighted two years ago by Queen Elizabeth II. I salute you, Sir David Frost. <laughs> Born in England in 1939, the son of a Methodist minister, Sir David is multi-talented the producer of countless television programs, author of 17 books, producer of seven films, publisher, lecturer, impresario, and the joint founder of two major network companies in the United Kingdom. He first appeared on television during his student days at Cambridge. He came to the BBC after he was spotted by a producer doing a parody of a news conference at a London nightclub. What followed was the satirical, that was the week that was. 31 years ago, he brought that was the week that was to the United States, a show that has been cited as the precursor of Laugh-In and Saturday Night Live. He's gone on to do serious interviews of almost all the world's leaders, including the six most recent presidents of the United States, the five most recent prime ministers of Britain. He's also interviewed Indira Gandhi, Golda Meir, Mikhail Gorbachev, Yasser Arafat, and Nelson Mandela. He has received two Emmy Awards for the David Frost Show. Friday night, he will be seen on We To Hear, 
in another of his Talking with David Frost series. His guest will be Senate Majority Leader Bob Dole. Despite his enormous, enormous success, however, Sir David has not given up being an iconoclast. His topic today is questioning authority from that was the week that was to talking with David Frost. Sir David. Bud, thank you very much indeed. Thank you all for that marvellous welcome. The, uh, and that introduction much better than the one I had in London at the Grosvenor House Hotel, where they didn't have anyone like Bud to introduce you. But they did have a Toastmaster in scarlet livery who was supposed to tap his gavel on the table and say, pray silence for Sir David Frost. And I don't know whether he was nervous or what, but instead he tapped his gavel on the table and said, pray for the silence of Sir David Frost. <coughs> he obviously knew what he was talking about, you know, the, uh, but uh, we all make mistakes. Uh, I mean, uh, I collect them, and my collection grows all the time. There was the, uh, there was, I've been adding all the time. There was a, the guy we sent out at TVAM uh, to Israel on a story, and uh, it was his first story, and he filed a report that began, Welcome to Israel, a mecca for tourists. <laughs> something wrong there I think somehow but uh, I was interviewing I remember a shop steward a trade union shop steward and he said at one point to me uh, he said there have been certain allegations made against me and I intend to find out who the alligator is <laughs> I mean I mean and, and then he went on to in fact he went <laughs> went on to say we are not all powerful. We are just helpless prawns. <laughs> we had helpless salmon, but they had helpless prawns. But the but uh, but no, I loved I loved mistakes. I a lot of them. A lot of them happen on radio. I find in England. For instance, uh, there was a guy called Nicholas Parsons recently who said, and now a record by Glenn Miller, who became a legend in his own lifetime by his untimely death. <laughs> you know, and, uh, and, the, and the news too in England, the, the radio news is very, very sacred, but there was one recently on BBC Radio 2 when the newscaster said, at the unorganized conference today, I'm sorry, at the UN organized conference today, <laughs> and, uh, and there was... <laughs> And there was a disc jockey also who said, uh, and this was on, also on radio, BBC Radio 2, said, and now a record for Mrs. Sylvia Davis, who is 111. I'm sorry. And now a record for Mrs. Sylvia Davis, who is ill. <laughs> anyway, it's a... That, that's my current collection, that particular. That's where we are at the moment. That's the, late, the latest one. Um, I'm, so, I'm so delighted to be here today, and uh, I want to echo the uh, welcome that, uh, that Bud gave, first of all, on my left here, to John Grant from PBS, and on my right here to Sharon, Sharon Rockefeller, who we're all delighted is back. Someone wrote about the fifth season of Talking with David Frost. We love the second season of Sharon Rockefeller at, at WETA. <laughs> and there's one other uh, person that I'd particularly like to introduce, because uh, in our situation we're starting as the new 1995 season with Bob Dole on Friday night, as you heard. And also, it's the occasion when we also are delighted to welcome ITT as our underwriters. Now, obviously, uh, we're delighted uh, to have one of America's greatest corporations as our underwriter, but at a moment when uh, 
PBS is under siege, uh, ITG coming on board in this way has been an inspiration really to everybody in the system. So would you please greet Juan Capello of ITT. <laughs> and in fact, the title of our, of our speech today, uh, the combination of questioning authority was, we thought that, well, that's a, we thought, that's more than one person. I'm not doing the royal we, I'm <laughs> lost track of my senses here. Because Margaret Thatcher once did that, she said, we are a grandmother. She said, <laughs> and everyone thought she thought she was the queen, you know, but the, uh, <laughs> on one, no, actually sweet, one another occasion, uh, someone said to her, just want you to know, Lady Thatcher, we miss you. And she said, you know, I miss me too. <laughs> Very her, you know, that, that, particular, that particular line. But we thought that uh, in terms of questioning authority, that um, that covers two different uh, parts of my life in the sense that, uh, as Bud was mentioning, uh, the first half was questioning authority in the sense of the satire and so on, and the second half was questioning authority in the sense of talking to authority figures and others one-on-one. Um, -on -one. And uh, I suppose actually the first part of this whole business, the questioning authority through satire, and that was the week that was, really started at Cambridge. And uh, one of the great figures at Cambridge at that time was someone who, as you may have read, we, we lost just recently, far too young, with Peter Cook, who you may remember from uh, Beyond the Fringe and all of those things. Brilliant man. I always remember doing cabaret with him at Cambridge. And I remember one day we were doing a cabaret. First one we'd done together, actually. And there'd been a story in the paper that day that in Cambridge, a restaurant in the middle of Cambridge, the Friar House, um, which is quite well known, had been prosecuted for having only one toilet. And so Peter bounded onto the stage, this group, and said, the next day, and said, I've got good news for you. The Friar House now has two toilets, but they do the cooking in one of them. <laughs> you know, you know, belting laugh. Imagine, Cambridge 35 years ago, it was, uh, it was brilliant. It was absolutely brilliant. And on one occasion, he went, when I was prosecuted for the amazing crime of riding a bicycle without lights, and I was called to appear at the Cambridge Magistrates Court at 10.30 in the forenoon, as it said on the piece of paper, to answer this question of riding a bicycle without lights. Um, Peter volunteered, he wanted to come along as my defense attorney, <laughs> and he was going to use the technique of alternative defense. And he was going to say, my client, was not in Cambridge on the day in question. Or, if he was in Cambridge on the day in question, he does not possess a bicycle. Or, <laughs> if he does possess a bicycle, it's got lights. Or if it hasn't got that, and so on. <laughs> and he was going to end up screaming and appealing for the death penalty. <laughs> I mean, got entirely confused. Now, luckily, we didn't go through with that because contempt of court is the one thing in England you can be put away in prison with, with sine die, in fact. But uh, he had a great, a great sense of humour, uh, Peter Cook, and, and we all miss him a hell of a lot. But, but so that it was at, at Cambridge that one really got involved in the, the satire side, and that was the week that was side. And that was the week that was, I mean, in England first and then America here, had... It had an enormous impact because particularly in England it was, it was somehow verbalizing something that from 1956, look back in anger uh, and Suez to 62, Britain had been begging for, young people had been begging for a voice that said, you know, our elders and betters may be elder, but they're not necessarily better, our leaders are not pure and all of that, and not doing everything for self-sacrifice and to help others and all of that. And that's what came through in 62. And so they were really, they were, they were really ready for all of that. And, and it took off immediately. The audience went two million, three, four, eight, seven, eight, 
nine twelve uh, over six weeks, and that was at a time when an audience was normally no, never never more than two. Um, I remember going after the sixth week of into Harrods, which I'd never been able to afford before, but I went into Harrods and, and I was writing out a cheque for something and the guy behind the counter says, six weeks into the series, he said, I just want you to know, Mr. Frost, I never miss your show. I said, thank you very much. He said, if we're out anywhere, we make sure that we're back home by 10.30 to make sure we don't miss it. I said, thank you very much indeed. And he said, and carried on writing out the show. And he said, and what's more, if we're at home, we make sure we've had dinner and that we've washed up and laid the table for breakfast before your show comes on <laughs> at 10.30. I said, thank you very much indeed. And handed over the check and he said, do you have any means of identification? <laughs> But there was all sorts of things we did in those days. I remember the sinking of the royal barge was written by someone who is the, this was about royal commentators and this was written by somebody who is today, in fact, the Secretary of State for Scotland. Uh, and, uh, but this is, his racy past comes to haunt him with this piece from time to time. It was a very good piece about royal commentators, you know, and so on. And now the Queen, smiling radiantly, is swimming for her life. You know what? Her Majesty's wearing a pale blue taffeta dress with matching legs and all that stuff. Anyway, the, um, the, uh, but we had a whole range of stuff and it really did take off in an extraordinary way. And then we had the thrill of coming over here and I had the thrill of coming over here with that was the week that was to a wonderful welcome, even better welcome than a broadcaster from Britain, Gilbert Harding had had in the 50s when he was very famous in Britain, not over here, he came over here and when he was filling in his immigration form in those days, back in the 50s, one of the clauses was still uh, that under the thing, is the reason for your visit to overthrow the Republic? <laughs> and he put, not sole purpose of trip. <laughs> Which <laughs> I thought was... I thought it was brilliant, you know, but uh, but he was arrested, in fact, on, only for <laughs> only for seven or eight minutes. But he was he was arrested, and uh, and then one had the thing of getting used to the difference, the old difference in language. I remember we went to do a launch thing in Dallas, and uh, but that was the week that was. And of course, one of the many ways in which America is so creative is in the, in the number of different names you have for the toilet. I mean, in Britain it's just boring old ladies and gentlemen, really, but here you have guys and dolls, senoras, senoritas, and Damon and Heron, and all of this stuff. And uh, we went to Dallas to launch the show down there, with, and my English secretary was with me on the trip, and she went off to, to the toilet, and she came back after about 20 seconds and said, excuse me, David, am I a heifer or a steer? <laughs> Yeah, but it's all a question of uh, getting used to these things. We had a wonderful libel action. The show was on NBC for two years, and uh, we had a wonderful libel action. There was one, Patsy England did an item, which was one week of a show that I was hosting, so that, but it was an item about, it was really more a New Yorker note than a joke, but it was said about a Mrs. Harriet Brown of Cleveland, age 92, has died leaving 91 grandchildren, 230 grandchildren, great-grandchildren, and 28 of the other. Anyway, 403 offspring in, in total. And the last line was, she wins this week's booby prize for birth control. <laughs> Pretty simple, straightforward remark. Aha! Uh -huh. the, uh, the 403 relatives of the late Mrs. Harriet Brown all sued. <laughs> NBC and me, as I was the host, for $15 million. First of all, on the grounds that this remark had exposed them to incredible humiliation in the streets of Cleveland. <laughs> well, I mean, how were they recognized? Are you a relative of the late Harry Brown? <laughs> I, mean, I mean, bizarre, isn't it? And they wanted uh, seven and a half million dollars for that. And then they also said that this remark suggested 
They were the product of excessive sexual activity. <laughs> and they wanted seven and a half million dollars for that. The remark, not the sexual activity, but, but the, uh, as if there could be such a thing anyway. So, that was $15 million. And eventually, the, 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 the thing was settled out of court for nothing by the NBC legal department. But, if, if there hadn't been a legal department working on it, it would have still cost a lot of money just to defend, to defend the suit. But that, but that was the real main legal threat to the program. Uh, the only other threat to the program was dear Senator Barry Goldwater's uh, Republican National Committee, who kept it off the air for six weeks in a row with uh, with Republican uh, announcements leading up uh, in the that was in the fall of 68 and uh, no fall of 64 I mean fall of 64 and they and they pre they each week the the, the RNC decided that they would take a half an hour on one of the three networks a different time whatever and each week they take a half an hour and each week they decided that the network would be NBC and each week they decided the day would be Tuesday, and each week they decided the time would be 9.30. And so they obviously decided, uh, and the only week we got on the air was one week when they, when, some, the, when the Democrats had booked a minute commercial in the program, and the Republicans didn't want to put out their broadcast with a Democratic commercial in the middle of it. So there was a total, total, total incomprehension going on at that particular point. But that was the other main, the main, uh, main problem. But at the time, uh, we, we, we came through that problem. Also, when you look back at that was the week that was shows in this country, one of the things that is most extraordinarily telling is the jokes actually work rather well still. They seem quite current. But it is the cigarette commercials that really seem so odd and out of another world. The show doesn't. But the cigarette commercials and people talking about the wonders of health wonders of cigarettes and so on. <laughs> you do realize it's a, a different world now in that particular area. But at that particular stage, after having done that was a week and this follow-up show in England, that was really when I decided I wanted to go on to questioning authority in another way and talking one-on-one -on -one to the people who had the power and so on. But before we, before we did that, we did actually do a program which I thought summed up authority rather well. It was a, a frost report in England. and. Uh, and there were some marvellous definitions of, of authority in it and wonderful examples of authority figures. This was, I quote this from the Sun newspaper, now just think of the mentality of this in terms of authority figures. Quote, council workmen are to rip up planks out of seats and make holes in the walls of bus shelters in an attempt to make the shelters too uncomfortable for hooligans. <laughs> Councillor Harry Beale said, Something has got to be done to stop the wrecking of these shelters. <laughs> so far as I can see, this is the only way. <laughs> I mean, I just love that, don't you? That's authority. That's authority in the action. So is this one. Newcastle Journal. At Middlesbrough Police Court yesterday, a solicitor asking for excuse from attendance of a client said, in the first place, he is a man of not very bright intellect. Secondly, he is employed on important government work. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful, isn't it? I mean, that, that's really is, that really is authority. In the, uh, and we analyse the language of authority. I remember, too, you know, that things like, the matter is under consideration means we've lost the file. <laughs> the matter is under active consideration means we're trying to find the file, you know, that, that sort of thing. But this is, this is a perfect example of authority in that. This is absolutely verbatim. Sir Thomas Padmore giving evidence to the Royal Commission on the Civil Service in London. He said this. What I have said has demonstrated that it is very difficult to find an answer to that question, but if I were pressed for an answer, I would say that, so far as we can see, taking it rather by and large, taking one time with another, and taking the average of departments, it is probable there would not be found to be very much in it either way. <laughs> Isn't that great? We've got people like that in Washington as well, haven't we? That was Sir Thomas Padmore in London. And then there was a sweet man who said he was a small rebel about against authority, I mean, that he keeps his medicines in a hot place. And when the radio says, turn the lights down low, it's time for dancing, he turns the lights up high and goes to bed. He was a rebel against authority. And, uh, but then this was the ultimate, this was the ultimate. This was a sign we found on the Yorkshire Moors that I think is distilled authority, which is this quote. It was a sign that just had these words on it, it said, it is forbidden to throw stones 
at this notice. <laughs> well, where do you go from there? I mean, the... Uh... Anyway, over the years, the authority figures... The authority figures have got, as you interview them, and you talk to leaders in other fields and so on, I think there's no doubt that politicians around the world have got franker. They have... The, the, it sounds unbelievable, but, uh, but they've got better. They've got... They've got Franker in answering some of the questions. Although there's an ongoing game as they get cleverer with one sort of answer, you've got to found an, find another way to go around that. But I mean, the thing that one used to always fear most of all, which was the bland leading the bland, the, you know, the politician who would, uh, you know, just the most daring thing he would do to, would be to oppose road accidents or something, uh, ask him his favourite colour and he'd say plaid. Um, you know, that, that does happen less and less now. And I mean, the, I remember there was a, a Democratic senator, for instance, just after the Attica jail riot. And I was interviewing him and I said, uh, you know, I mean, Attica jail riot, he was, he was Democratic and there was Republican governors and all of that sort of thing uh, involved. Uh, had to have something to say about that. But he, I said, what did he think about the Attica jail riot? And, but he was still playing safe, and he said, just said, you know, well, he couldn't pon possibly comment on that because he wasn't there at the time. <laughs> well, I knew he wasn't there at the time. You know, maybe some of his constituents would have missed. He had been there at the time, but I knew that he wasn't. Um, and so I said, no, well, in that case, what do you feel about the case for prison reform in America? And he said, rather like that civil servant, he said, well, he thought there might be a case for a modicum of prison reform. Not too big a modicum, mind you. Not too small a modicum, either. But a modicum of a modicum of a modicum. And I was going berserk trying to get him to say something definite about anything. So I finally said, well, all right then. What is there that you would go out on a limb for, no matter how unpopular it made you? And he said, well, David. And when a politician says, well, David, in that sincere sort of manner, you know there's crap on the way. <laughs> and sure enough, there was. And he said, what I'd like to see here in America and is an era of prosperity, not only for our children, but for our children's children. And our children's 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 children. And abroad, abroad, an era of peace throughout the world. And I said, well, I didn't expect you to come out for war and poverty. You know. <laughs> Pathetic. Later on, he actually said, where would this country be without this great land of ours? <laughs> Words to words to live by and so on. But that's why, in fact, people are really candid and so on and uh, um, are so refreshing. I remember interviewing uh, Gough Whitlam, the then Australian Prime Minister, and it was prime time, so lots of viewers were watching, and we were talking about the then Prime Minister of England, Edward Heath, uh, and they'd just come back from the Ottawa conference. He said he thought Edward Heath was a bit of a bore, and he thought Lee Kuan Yew thought he was Oliver Cromwell, and so on and so forth. Being very frank about ev everything, and we got on the subject of the 104 Russian spies that Edward Heath had just expelled from Britain. And uh, we were talking about this, and uh, he said, oh, well, of course, uh, you always had more Russian spies in England than we have in Aust here in Australia. Well, now, I'd never heard a Prime Minister talk openly about spies or spying, but I thought, been very frank about everything else, worth having a go. All right, then. Not particularly expecting an answer. I said, how many Russian spies are there in Australia? And Whitlam said, six. <laughs> and I said, oh, yes, I'm... <laughs> how many Chinese spies are there in Australia? <laughs> And he said, oh, there's, there's fewer, there's only three, or possibly four. I said, oh, yes, they'd have more trouble getting a visa, wouldn't they? And, and I said, tell me, uh, are there any uh, British spies in Australia? He said, well, of course there are. There are more British spies in Australia than from any other country, except, of course, from America. And I said, and are there any Australian spies in Britain? And Whitlam, Whitlam said, ah, that's a secret. <laughs> great sense of timing. But then there are people today in, uh, interviewing Benazir Bhutto. Uh, again, she's 
very frank and charming, statuesque and beautiful too. Uh, but, but we had her on talking with David Frost on uh, in November, and then I interviewed her again in London. And while we were in Islamabad, I'd heard this rumor, which we didn't refer to in the first conversation. So I was talking to her in London, and I said, I, 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 I hear that we should congratulate you. Uh, and she said, Oh, why? I said, Well, I understand you're planning. I heard you're planning a fourth child. And she said, David, do male politicians get asked questions like that when all they've done is put on a little weight? <laughs> and she said, look here, I'm 41, 42, and I've let myself go a bit. And it's just such an enchanting, she looked stunning, of course, beautiful there, but it was a delightful form of candor, do you know what I mean? The thought of her letting herself go a bit, rather, it's just, she hasn't at all, of course. And, it, and, and she can be very moving as well, I mean, Benazir Bhutto is an outstanding figure. I remember when she, in her second period as Prime Minister, was acclaimed much more than her first, but I remember just after she took power for the first time, won a democratic election uh, in uh, December of 88, we did, just after she got in, two days afterwards, we did a satellite interview, and I always remember because at the end I was talking about her father and how her father had fallen to a, an army overthrow, and the army had then killed him. And uh, did she, with this fragile civilian democracy, fear the same thing? And she said, David, you cannot live on your fears. You can only survive on your hopes. Which I thought was a, a great reply when talking of a dead father and so on. I suppose one of the most charismatic people since I've been talking one-on-one -on -one to these figures, I mean, m most charismatic probably I've, I've always said was Robert Kennedy in many ways. The, uh, this is the last long personal interview he ever gave. and. Um, I remember at one point asking the question I've asked a lot of people about, how would you like to be remembered? Uh, what would you like to be the first line of your obituary? And he said, with an awesome dramatic irony, well, there's a line in Albert Camus about the fact that this is a world in which children suffer. And I'd like to have made a contribution, very Kennedy phrase, made a contribution to lessening that suffering. And then one of the simplest sentences I've ever had from a politician in my life, really, just simply 12 words, not a two-syllable word in the sentence, and he just said, for if we do not do this, then who will do this? And it's only in the last two years that I've ever really met anybody who, in that sense, what is charisma? My definition always was just Robert Kennedy, because um, it's a difficult word to explain. and. Uh, and Robert Kennedy, of course, had that lovely self-mocking thing as well. You, remember, you may remember that the most definite anti-word used about him was that he was ruthless. And uh, yes, but he's ruthless. He may be, he may be a great speaking man, but he's ruthless. That was the great accusation against him. And when I was interviewing, I was actually thinking more about uh, Ed the Edith Hamilton quote he often used about men are not made for safe havens. And I said to him, now, a lot of people accuse you of being reckless. And he said, no, 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 ruthless. <laughs> Which was so sweet, he was helping me out with a tough question by trying to toughen it up a bit, you know, as I, he thought I'd intended. I said, no, no, ruthless later, we'll stick with re reckless for now. But that was, that sort of self-mocking thing was enchanting too. But in the last couple of years, uh, we did, uh, Nelson Mandela and President F.W. de Klerk for uh, talking with David Frost last year, and that was an unforgettable experience. And Nelson Mandela is someone else who would serve as a definition for the word charisma as well. I mean, of course, there is the miracle with Nelson Mandela. The, the greatest miracle of all is, is how he could emerge from 28 years of wrongful incarceration without any bitterness. I mean, it is a miracle. And I said to him, I said, what is it? I mean, uh, why is it you're not bitter? Is it, did you find religion? Did that, what was it? Why, why aren't you bitter? Uh, and instead of sort of saying, well, it's very generous of you to say that, or, you know, something like that, he, he went the other way. He just said, I would like to be bitter, but there is no time to be bitter. There is work to do. And it was just a, a marvelous, such a marvelous definition. I mean, and obviously, the, during that period of three or four years of negotiation, I mean, Nelson Mandela, with no experience, 
of uh, anything other than a prison for years. And President F.W. de Klerk, with no experience of uh, working with blacks uh, in South Africa, uh, they both, they both scarcely put a foot wrong in that period. But I'm reminded of that quote about, not talking of Nelson Mandela, I'm reminded of that quote of the person who said, vision without action is fruitless. Action without vision is pointless. But action with vision can change the world. And that's obviously what happened in the case of Nelson Mandela. Now, I know I've got to allow some time for questions, so we ought to turn to the questions at this particular point in the proceedings. Thank you very much indeed. A number of questions on public television, so let me kind of condense them right. into one. What do you see as the future of public television, particularly now that government funding may be reduced? Well, obviously, uh, we all uh, hope that it won't, in the end, be reduced, and certainly that it won't be zeroed out. And indeed, the words of Senator Bob Dole on Friday night, as you'll see, in terms of not being zeroed out, um, those are very positive and encouraging words. Um, they're not uh, words that suggest that nothing will change. That would be uh, misquoting him. But he is um, very clear that, that there can be some form of compromise, in his opinion. Um, now, so that's encouraging to a certain extent, as we said. Um, I think in general that the role and the future of public television, I mean, I think in fact, sometimes people confuse the multitude of channels with thinking that people have a multitude of choice, but there are certain choices that PBS supply, supply that, I mean, 80 sports channels or whatever, would, would, ne would never supply. And I think there's never been more need for PBS than at the moment, and uh, I hope that that the battle will go on, and I think it should go on at the grassroots too, because, I mean, we talked in the uh, interview with Senator Bob Dole, I quoted those polls that showed 84% of people, including 80% of Republicans and so on, uh, came out strongly for PBS in this particular argument. And I think there's a little bit of the argument that Ted Kennedy used about National Endowment for the Arts. I know it's more money than that, but, you know, when he said that's equivalent that's less than the Pentagon spend on brass bands or something for the National Endowment of the Arts, and I'm sure we can get some corking good examples in this particular case of that. But, uh, although it's 285 rather than 100 plus. And, uh, but I think this represents an investment for America, I think it represents uh, a bit of uh, false economy. And uh, there are other things to cut before this. I understand the point that indeed Senator Dole made in the interview, which is, but if everybody says, but, but, you know, I'm all for the, this budget cutting, but you must leave mine alone, that obviously, um, in that sense, everybody could say that and they'd get nowhere at all. Uh, I understand that particular point. But I think that there's a, an argument to be had and an argument the public are very receptive to, that this, this sort of 14% uh, contribution to public broadcasting or to PBS, um, and it's more for certain vital sectors than others, is, represents a bloody good investment and is something that should not be touched. Uh, if it is to be touched, to be touched as gently as possible. But I do think that there's a message to be got there and a message that people are very receptive to because they see the value of what they get out of this. The arguments about uh, Big Bird and Barney and the profits from that uh, are really sort of irre irrelevant because the truth of it is that things like Sesame Street cost a fortune and the way that PBS, with its difficult budget circumstances, managed to get those shows on the is by getting other people to invest in them and those people who invest in them obviously have to have their reward as well and it's a way of getting something on the air which otherwise wouldn't be on the air in the first place. It's not money that's escaping the system, it's the economies they've already put into action that mean they have to do things in that way. So I think it's a good investment, of course I would say that, wouldn't I? But I do in terms of looking at broadcasting around the world that, that it is very important, I think, that there should be public service broadcasting. There should be, across the whole ecology of broadcasting, there should be something of everything. There should be the commercial channels, the cable, the satellite channels. But the, but the interaction of public service broadcasting with the more traditional forms is positive, is good, and that's why we need the BBC in Britain, we need PBS in America, we need the ABC in Australia, and uh, let's hope they're all freestanding in a year or two's time. 
Do you think the Corporation for Public Broadcasting should be made subject to the freedom of information laws? I have no idea. Bob Dole raised that in the interview as well, and I l simply don't know the background to that. What do you think, Bud? <laughs> yes. He thinks so. Bud says yes. Next one. All right, everybody wants to know your perspective on the future. Oh. What do you think the future holds for the monarchy? Right. <laughs> the future of the monarchy. Well, I think, strangely enough, that it will continue. It will, partially because, you know, People magazine journalists would be out of a job if, uh, <laughs> if it went, and that would be very serious. But um, I think that, in fact, it will prevail, and I think it will prevail for two reasons. Um, one is to do with the fascination that people have with some of the personalities involved, and, so on, and in, in a pure Dallas dynasty sort of way. But secondly, you've got to remember that it does do this great thing for us in Britain, uh, and that's, that is it means you can get rid of a prime minister without having to get rid of your head of state. And we all know the agonies that knowing that President Nixon should go as president, that everybody had about, about the impeachment, potential impeachment and so on, was to do with the fact that also it was the head of state, not just the head of the government going. And in Britain, the head of the government can be replaced without putting us through that tremendous agony that a lot of people went through in America who knew that President Nixon had to go, but at the same time found it very difficult to do that to someone who's the commander in chief and all of that. So, so that there is a constitutional plus for this. There's, I suppose, there's also a tourist plus, I suppose, as well, uh, in the sense that Lots of people, you know, who'd want to come to England to look at old buildings run by, you know, small R Republicans, not big R Republicans, but small, you know. Though this used to be the place where the Queen was, but now, yes, it's very, very nice educational department building. I mean, who's going to go around Buckingham Palace in those circumstances? No, I think there are all those reasons. In general, financially, the British people get a good deal out of the royal family when you balance tourism with the rest. Of course, the, the role is changing with all these headlines and so on. Um, and, the, and the, I mean, it's the same, the same parallel really in terms of journalistic coverage exists to do with the royals and their private lives, the, to do with the same sort of coverage that applies now to presidents and, and others, but didn't apply to President Kennedy. I mean, this has, this has really transformed the reporting of, of royals and presidents too. I mean, this, that's a new era. And so it is a new era that probably if, if you did a poll, might diminish a certain amount of respect and so on. Uh, but if it did that, it would probably do it even more for the journalists. Do you think the week that was would work at the present time? Yes. I think the week that was would work at the present time. Uh, there are things that happen at the moment you think they couldn't be improved by comedy, you know, they're so unbelievable around the world at the moment. But I think there should always be a program like that was the week that was on the air, a program that deals with the issues of the time. I think particularly it should be done ideally by the, by the new group in town, by the new, new people before they get to know the politicians too, too well. I don't mean the politicians would then muffle them, but, but as soon as you, if you're doing a satire program, you want quite a lot of it to be the broad brushstrokes of caricature and so on, and uh, if you know the guy who gave a terrible speech in the Senate yesterday had been up all night with his sick child, um, it, it affects the ability to write a, you know, a slashing sketch about what an inept speech it was. And so there is an argument for a new caricaturing type band to come zooming in uh, every five or ten years. But we do need that on the air. We do need that irreverence on the air. And, uh, but I think it needs to be done by a new sort of force coming in every few years with a point of view. Interestingly, because in England when we did that, was, as I was implying, that was we that was in England was absolutely at the moment where the people wanted that to be heard, that the olders and betters were not perfect, that they were, they were not incorruptible, they were not totally full of self-sacrifice, that they were out of touch, that they were uninspiring, and so on and so forth. And that message came through, and whether that was the week that was, 
influence the Times more than the Times influence that was the week that was, I don't know, but the two of them were dynamite together. And uh, the Times with a small t, not the Times with a, a capital T. Uh, and then in America it was slightly different. When that was the week that was came here, it was the irreverence that was the key to it, because politically there wasn't the same feeling as there had been in England of an old regime, an ancien regime that needed to be chucked out. In America there was more hope or optimism in the beginning of, uh, that was the week that was here in uh, 64, because uh, in the following on from the death of President Kennedy, actually everybody was rooting for Lyndon Johnson at that particular moment to step into the shoes and all of that. So it wasn't, in that part of it, the social part of it wasn't the same as it was in England, but the irreverence part still worked. And if that irreverence can work in a time like that when everyone was sort of trying to be optimistic, um, how much more today there should be this on the ball, up to the minute coverage. There's, there should be the sophisticated coverage by those who know as well, obviously. But there ought to be this new band coming over the hillside now to have a go at everything, including all of us. The tape that, uh, the week that was made right after the Kennedy assassination in 1963, is it available anywhere? <clears throat> I think it is. I don't know. I don't know whether it's um, the tape of the, this. What happened was that was we that was in England was always on a Saturday night at 10:30 approximately, as the man from Harrods said. And the therefore the news of John F. Kennedy's death came through the night before, Friday night, with a five-hour, six-hour time difference um, at about 7 7:30. Uh, and we started, we were oddly enough going to a cer ceremony where we were going to receive a, an award as the, it was an industry sort of Emmys type thing and we were receiving an award for that was week that was. But the whole evening was obviously totally decimated by this, by this news. Um, but we started talking to the people who, who wrote for us on the phone and thinking about, and we thought obviously tomorrow we're going to have to do something on this for the first 15 or 20 minutes and then deal with the rest of the week. Early the next morning we realized there was no other, there was no rest of the week, even in Britain. And that was one of the remarkable things that uh, an American president, but in Britain there was no other rest of the week. So we sent everyone away. We wrote a new program that lasted only not like the usual 50 minutes, but about 29, uh, perhaps a bit less. And, and I had to go out with the audience beforehand that night and and do a, a freeze up. I mean, as opposed to a warm up, I had to say, you know, there are no laughs t tonight and so on. And there was a Herbert Kretzmer who wrote the lyrics in later for Les Miserables, wrote a wonderful song for Millicent Martin, a whole song written and composed uh, and broadcast within a matter of hours. And Bernard Levin did a very thoughtful piece, and Dame Sybil Thorndike, and we did our think pieces and so on. Anyway, the, the program, when the program was over, it, it emerged, now we're talking obviously 1963 here, that, that Donald Babasok, who was very far-sighted, today cassettes, the, put it on the bird, satellites and all that are, are easy. Um, but in those days, not the case. But, but he managed to make a recording on the American line standard of this program as it went out and it shipped it over to the States and it started showing on NBC on the Sunday evening and showed again and again in fact through Monday as well and there was in fact a, a record of this in answer to the question a record was produced which uh, with the proceeds obviously going to charity and that um, and that sold a great deal of copies at that time I have seen the tape because, because at the 25th anniversary of of the assassination, um, I happened to see part of the tape and uh, Milson Martin's song, which absolutely was amazing to think this very moving song had been written and composed in the course of a day. And uh, but whether that tape's available in answer to the question, I don't know. There was a record that was available, and the uh, and in fact, I've just been handed a note that in fact the tape can be seen at the Museum of. Uh, Museum of Broadcasting, in fact, that, that tape. But so, so the tape does exist in this country. Of course, this is the other thing, you see. Today, 
you pick your nose, you can have a cassette the next day. <laughs> I mean, you can do anything on television. I was on for four seconds, here's a cassette. But, you know, back then, I mean, it was quite different. And tapes were not kept. They were either two-inch tapes or they were films. And so this is why the, the, it's quite different today, the, the instant proximity of these things today. Yes. All right, I'll try to condense a couple uh, for you. Have you tried to interview Princess Di or Prince Charles? If no, why not? And who would you like to interview the most that has turned you down? Very good. Very, well, you've agreed now, bud, haven't you? So we can take you off yes. the list. Right, that's right. But that's excellent. The, um, I, I have interviewed Prince Charles. Um, I interviewed Prince Charles, oddly enough, on the eve of his investiture. I pronounced it right. It's one of those words, investiture. Like Antonioni, someone said about the Italian film director, I know how to spell it, I just don't know when to stop. You know. <laughs> You know, invested did it, did it, did sure. You know, anyway, I got it right here. So I, at the time, he was invested did it, did sure. Um, I interviewed him, and one of the interesting things, he was, he was obviously quite young because he's just celebrated the. Well, this was 1969. Yeah, 69. And uh, he was marvellous and very funny about the Goon Show and all of that. And uh, and oh, and he said, one point that was very interesting was I said to him, now, what is it like? We can all grow up, we can have whatever ambitions or whatever we, we want or whatever, uh, we, and we don't know whether they'll come to pass, but in your case, you know, I mean, you know, I, I said, I, for instance, I wanted to be a railway engine dr driver and, and, uh, and then a soccer player, but that was pointless in your case because your future was preordained, predecided. I mean, it was all irrelevant to you. And what effect did that have? And he said, well, yes, he said, well, he said, I was, um, I am, um, wanted to be a railway engine driver too, but then I woke up one morning when I was about six and I realised I was sort of stuck. <laughs> and I thought, sort of stuck, <laughs> as a way of describing becoming the king, was a masterly piece of British understatement, you know. <laughs> Rather like the rich man in Chelsea who said to his chauffeur, Drive over a cliff, James. I'm committing suicide. <laughs> you know, but, but the. Uh, <laughs> but uh, as to people who we haven't interviewed, um, that. Uh, well, General de Gaulle was one. I mean, General de Gaulle promised me an interview on the third morning when he rose again. <laughs> But he never turned up. <laughs> never turned up. There we all were waiting. And uh, so he's one. Now, the Pope doesn't uh, do a lot of interviews, and uh, I don't think the Queen's ever been interviewed, indeed. Even by Prince Philip, indeed. <laughs> but, uh, but the. Uh, the uh, but, uh, but I suppose, in fact, I've interviewed. I haven't interviewed Boris Yeltsin yet, which I look forward to doing. I have interviewed uh, Gorbachev a couple of occasions, which was a great experience. And you know how bef before an interview, of course, we were doing this in Moscow, and they were had, he had the best simultaneous... I've always said interpreters are killers of interviews, or, you know, and in general that is true. But this interpreter, he was so simultaneous in his interpretations that it, it was fantastic. And, of course, he always has, a la jokes about Jerry Ford, he also has to flick the sound so that he goes from telling you what he's saying to the other way around and doesn't forget and send them the wrong way, these signs. And just before the interview, it's always very important, you know, if there's a pause before an interview is ready to start, that you leap in there and uh, in some way uh, keep everything happy and bubbling and so there's not a silence or a lacuna while that last thing is sorted out with one of the cameras. And so we were ready to start. The simultaneous interpreter was there, but there was one thing being sorted out on the camera, so I, I thought we'd better fill in. And we were talking with the simultaneous interpreter, and so I said, oh, I said to him, my son, uh, Miles, came home from school and said, Daddy, I can say two words in any language in the world. And I said, OK then, Miles, Swahili. And he said, Coca-Cola. <laughs> and it's sort of hilarious telling this man who changed the world this, this tale. But anyway, he roared with laughter. And then he said, 
Ah, he said, but now there are two other words that are known in every language in the world, glasnost and perestroika. Which I thought was really interesting. He was very on the ball, and even off camera, he was going to make the point about his uh, his historic role there with the two words glasnost and perestroika. So M Boris Yeltsin would be another one. What? All right, yeah, we have to. This is the last almost question. Almost close up. Almost, almost. Before we get to that certificate of appreciation for appearing here at the club. Thank you very much. And a National Press Club mug. Brilliant. Which you can. <laughs> Brilliant. Which you could trade in for a tie. If you like. <laughs> I'll swap it for a time. My tie is getting worn from last time. Well, uh, Thank you very much. Last question. Last question. Right, last question. Oh, which of the many public figures you've interviewed had the best sense of humor, and which, who had the worst? <laughs> I'm trying to think who had the worst. I'll come back to that in a minute. Um, well, you'll see, President Dole is uh, President Dole. President Dole of the future. <laughs> Senator Dole would be President Dole, not would be Vice President Dole, but would be President Dole. Uh, has a pretty good sense of humour, and you, you can see on Friday what he says in answer to this question: If Newt Gingrich did decide to run, would you feel? You should stand aside and give him a clear run. <laughs> Answers on Friday night at 10. But uh, the, uh, the <laughs> but there's someone with a good sense of humor. Um, but uh, now the best sense of humor. Well, in the early days, you know, Muhammad Ali always had a remarkable sense of humor before he became ill. And I, I have a great fondness for those uh, those moments. I suppose the man, in fact, who had the worst sense of humor uh, with, was Boulder von Schirach, head of the former head of the Hitler Youth, <laughs> and Reichsfuhrer of Vienna. I thought we'll end this lunch on a happy note. <laughs> but the... Uh, <laughs> but, um, and the point about him was that he had no a sense of humor or sense of um, understanding or knowledge um, of, about what he'd been through, what he was responsible for, what was wrong with it. When you say to a man like that, what would you say is the one thing that's important for future generations in Germany to remember about Adolf Hitler? Well, there's only one answer to that, isn't it? The genocide of six million people. And you say, what's the one thing they should remember about Adolf Hitler? And he says, it's a wonderful way that he dealt with unemployment <laughs> in the 30s. Well, it says it all, doesn't it? You know, so that was the... But there were also things... He said, as we walked around the garden before the interview, he said... He said... You did that was the week that was at the age of 23. And I became head of the Hitler Youth at the age of 23. So you and I, Mr. Frost, have a great deal in common. <laughs> That's what I mean about sense of humor. Thank you. Uh, before, we, before we conclude... Thank you very much. Thank you. Before we conclude, a uh, member of the audience sends up a introduction for your collection and wonders if you will accept it. it was told to him by Admiral Crow. He was speaking at a Kiwanis club in the Midwest and was introduced in this way. We will now hear the latest dope from Washington. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. That one you can have. I'll add that to the collection. Thank you all so much for being a terrific audience. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>